We saw in our last study that in Cain and Abel we see the beginning of two streams which end up in the book of Revelation as Babylon and Jerusalem. Both are religious streams. Cain was not an atheist. Cain did not approach a false god. He approached the true god. But he approached the true god in a wrong way. Abel came with blood. In his sacrifice, he came with faith in his heart. And he came with righteousness in his life. And that's the thing that made the difference. There was blood in his sacrifice, faith in his heart and righteousness in his life. And I think above everything else, he had what the Bible says uh, are the acceptable sacrifices of God, a broken and a contrite spirit. And we can say that essentially the difference between Jerusalem and Babylon is this. Jerusalem comprises of those who have a broken and a contrite spirit. That is the sacrifice that God accepts. We need to compare this verse in Psalm 51 with the sacrifices that these two brothers brought. It says in Psalm 51, verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. And if the word of God says that God had respect unto Abel, and to his sacrifice, it must mean that Abel had a broken spirit. Because that was, behind that sacrifice was a broken spirit. That's what made it acceptable. Whereas behind the offering of Cain was an arrogant spirit, of one who was self-confident and capable, and God rejected it. It's the same today. There are those who come to God in faith with a broken spirit and they are accepted. There are others who come in pride and self-sufficiency and who are rejected no matter what they bring. And we must never forget it because we live in the midst of a Christendom that does not place the emphasis on the heart behind the offering. Always the emphasis is on the offering. If a man gives one lakh to a Christian work, so much is made of that. Oh, one lakh. It may be Cain giving that one lakh. That's, it doesn't seem to disturb a lot of Christians. It does disturb God. Or someone gives something for the Lord's work, his full time, he gives up his job or something. That's not the thing. The point is what's behind that sacrifice? Is it a broken spirit? Otherwise we can never build the church. And it is those who do not have a broken spirit who end up persecuting those who do have a broken spirit, calling them heretics, etc. It's a very interesting word we see in Gen uh, Revelation chapter 18 concerning Babylon, verse 24. Revelation 18 is all about Babylon. And uh, in the last verse of this chapter on Babylon, Revelation 18, 24, it says, And in Babylon was found the blood of prophets and of saints and listen to this and of all who have been slain on the earth who was the first Abel the blood of Abel it says here was found in Babylon so we have New Testament confirmation of the fact that the religion Cain started was the religion of Babylon Revelation 18.24 proves that beyond doubt. And that's why it's very important for us to study Cain. Because then we have an understanding of Babylon today. Now we move on to Revelation, uh, sorry, Genesis chapter 4. We saw that Cain was also a picture of the Jews who crucified Christ. Abel was a picture of Christ and Cain was a picture of the Jews 
And we can say that the Jews had a Babylonian religion and Jesus had the religion of Jerusalem from above. And one persecuted the other. It's the same thing happening today. When we proclaim the truth of Jerusalem and the true church, there is always the Babylonians who are there to persecute. But we read here that God had mercy on Cain like he's had mercy on the Jews. And he spared him. He spared the Jews. But it says here finally, verse 16, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. This is hell. Hell means no presence of the Lord. There's a phrase in English called a God-forsaken place. The only truly God-forsaken place is hell. That's really a God-forsaken place. What is the fire of hell? The fire of hell is the fact that God is not there. Mercy is not there. God's mercy is removed. And that is what makes hell, hell. So we see here, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, which means wandering east of Eden, which means there was some manifestation of the Lord's presence, probably at the gate of Eden. When he went out from the presence of the Lord means he went away from there. Maybe that was the place where they offered these sacrifices, at the gate of Eden. And then Cain had relations with his wife and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. Now this is not the Enoch who walked with God. This is quite a contrast to that Enoch who comes later on in chapter 5. This is another man who was the son of Cain, the first son of Cain. And it's very interesting to see what Cain did. He built a city. And there we have, as we go through this chapter, you'll see the rise of five things that begin with Cain's descendants. And the first thing that begins is the beginning of city life. God made man to live in a garden. God made man to live by the sweat of his ground, but Cain was the first person who built a city. And we know that there is a lot of evil that has come through city life. But Cain was the one who began that, and he called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. This desire to perpetuate one's name is there began with, uh, e, uh, with Cain. He wanted to glorify the name of his son. This city will be called Enoch. So that for generations people will remember my son. We see it today also. So and so memorial building. You know where it began? With Cain's son. So and so memorial church. You see Babylon is there right from there. Naming something after a person. This room was donated by so and so. It's there. Cain began that type of stuff. This fan was donated by so and so. I've seen it. It's amazing. This chair was donated by so and so in some church building. It started with Cain who put a name to that city to perpetuate one's name. It's a terrific lust. Grandfathers who are very eager that their grandchildren should be named after them. Cain started this business. This name must be perpetuated. Why can't we just live and die? And let be forgotten. Why this great lust, the spirit of Babylon, it's permeated all over. It began with Cain. And yet, what about Abel? No city was named after him. But do you know what the word of God says about Abel? Turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and you'll see a contrast. There you see the difference between Abel and Cain. The difference between Jerusalem and Babylon. Hebrews 11.4 By faith, Abel offered to God a more better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, listen to this, though no city was built after his name, though he is dead, 4,000 years later and now 6,000 years later, he is still speaking. He is still speaking more than that other son of 
Cain's called Enoch. That city which Cain built for his son is destroyed long ago. In fact, most people don't even know about it. But Abel, his life still speaks. What do we see the contrast in these two things? Abel speaks by his life. Whereas Cain wanted his son's name to be exalted. And that is the difference. Do you want people to know your name? Your name should be well known. Or are you more concerned that your life should bless others? This is the difference between Jerusalem and Babylon. And we need to see it. Never mind if nobody knows our name. Never mind if people forget all about our name. But if our life can make an impression on them that even after we are dead and gone, even if no grandchild of mine is ever named after my name, I'm not interested in that. But that the influence of my life should carry on to generations. That's much more important than having a silly name carried on. That's something we need to be gripped by. It's not a small thing. Because we all love to... We all love our own name. There's a book written by uh, a world famous man in America called Dale Carnegie who wrote a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's written for businessmen, how to uh, promote your business and how to be a good speaker and all. One of the things he says in that book is the sweetest word in the English language to any human being is his own name. You see, he studied human character and he said that. And so when you speak to a man, he says, frequently use his name. And he'll really be happy with you. It's really, he studied human character. We love our own name. And when people speak about our name, it means something to us. Unless we have cleansed ourselves from this spirit of Cain and of Babylon, that it means nothing. That we are only interested in our life. Think of that, my brothers and sisters, the rise of city life and promoting one's own name. There's a verse in Proverbs 10, 7, which says, The memory of the righteous is blessed. That is Abel. This contrast actually in Proverbs 10, 7 is between Abel and Cain, son. The memory of the righteous is blessed, but the name of the wicked will rot. It's not a name. It's a memory of a righteous, God-fearing, humble, kind, pure, upright man. We don't know what his name was, but the influence of his life really blessed him. Covet that, my brothers and sisters, that we leave that impression when we leave the earth like Abel, instead of having some room donated by us or some fan donated by us, which informs everybody about our name. That, that'll rot. So that's the first thing we see here. And the next thing we see in Genesis 4 is in verse 18, Now to Enoch was born Erad, and Erad became the father of Mehujael, and Mehujael became the father of Methushel. Methushel became the father of Lamech in Genesis 4.19. And Lamech took to himself two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other Silla. Once you begin to move away from God, you begin to perpetuate your own name, and you begin to move into immorality. Two wives, one is not enough. Coveting another woman after being married to one. Maybe society does not permit people to have two wives now. People are scared to do that. There was no rules those days. But the spirit can still be there in a man today. Though he's married to one, he's not happy with that one. And sometimes he wishes he had married somebody else. What spirit does he have? He has the spirit of Lamech. Who wants another wife. But he won't take one because society does not permit it. If he were living in Lamech's day, he would have had two wives. Lots of people living today, even so-called believers. If they were living in Lamech's day, they'd have had two wives. Because they're not happy with the one they have. My brothers and my dear brothers, if you're not happy with the wife you have, you've got the spirit of Lamech. You're wishing some, you, you're married to somebody else. And the chances are, if you were living there, you would have married another one. That is Babylon. Unfaithfulness in married life is the essence of Babylon. The essence of Babylon. 
And there's a lot of this marital unfaithfulness in the thought life of lots of so-called believers. God's not fooled just because some of them talk about the new and living way. The spirit of Lamech. You see what began to rise when Cain went out from the presence of the Lord? God's grace left him. And then all the spirit of Babylon developed so quickly. Marital unfaithfulness, the development of city life and the man naming the city after his own son. And Then, verse 20, Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. There we see the rise of musical instruments. It's very interesting to note that musical instruments were not invented by the descendants of Abel or Seth after him. They were invented by the descendants of Cain after he went out from the presence of the Lord. I'm not saying, therefore, musical instruments are sinful. Just like I'm not saying that living in a city is sinful, even though city... The first city was built by Cain. We're all living in a city now. But we must remember that. City life began with Cain. There are dangers. We need to beware of them. Musical instruments began with Cain's children. Never forget that. Then you've got to keep that in mind when, even when we have music in the church or so-called Christian music. The spirit of the world can easily come in just because the words are Christian. So much of so-called Christian music today Absolutely godless. I can't imagine Jesus Christ sitting and listening to any of that rubbish. It's called Christian because they put the name of Jesus in it. I'm sure Jubal would have been glad to put such names also in it if it made his music more popular. It's the spirit, not the words. We've often said in the church, when you listen to a man preach, don't listen to the words. Listen to the spirit of the man. Gauge the spirit of the man. Remember this, my brothers and sisters, wherever you listen to people speaking, if you just listen to the words, I've heard believers, even so-called new and living way believers, as they call themselves, saying, oh, so-and-so is all right, he's teaching the right thing. Nil discernment. Nil. They can't discern his spirit. They can't discern the way he begs for money. They can't discern the way he violate scriptural principles. They say, oh, but he says so many nice things. He's so kind. He's so good. When will they have discernment? Listen to the spirit of a man. The same thing in music. It is not the words. It's the spirit behind it. It can never be justified by words. Just like preaching cannot be justified by words. The spirit. And there we have to judge ourselves to be able to get discernment. When man or a woman doesn't have discernment, can be pretty sure they are not judging themselves in their private life. That's why God doesn't give them discernment. They remain undiscerning, only listening to words, undiscerning about music, undiscerning about so many so-called Christian preachers. So there's the rise of musical instruments, string instruments, breath instruments, lyre and pipe. 